Okay gang, let's take a look at actually running a single sample hypothesis test for proportions. Uh, you're going to see as we progress through this page, some of the terms are new, some of them might be a bit familiar, and it, it's going to be initially overwhelming. You're going to have to give me a few examples before you really start to feel the patterns coming through all of these. And I won't explain all of the numbers theoretically right away. I'm going to have us get a few of these numbers under our belt, especially something called a p-value. And then I will talk about what, what all of this means, okay? So some of the new terms, um, well, actually, let's, let's talk about one of the more familiar terms. You're going to have a null and you're an alternate, all right? That's part of this 13-step write-up. Um, for the null, we've been talking about it. After both the ho and the ha, there should be a colon, right? And whatever parameter you have in your null, it should also be in your alternate. So because we're going to be looking at problems in proportion land, you see a P here, and in your alternate you'll also have a P. You'd have some number, uh, it's in the wording of the problem somewhere, right, that, that's the status quo, the claim that you assume to be true, whatever the number here, some number between 0 and 1, we did an airline example of 77%, but whatever the proportion in your null, it should also be the same proportion in your alternate. The thing that changes from your null and your alternate is this symbol here. The equals to always goes on the null, and on an alternate, you'll either have a greater than, a less than, or not equals to, right? These two are one-tailed tests. This is a two-tailed test, right? Right tail, left tail, two-tail. Right, so let me just make sure we remember that from last time. So here's right tail. This is the left tail test, and this is the two tailed test. Okay. I should write tailed. All right, this one here, the two tailed, in certain circumstances is equivalent to a confidence interval. or at least the outcomes are equivalent to a confidence interval. I will explain that relationship when we get to example eight. We're not there yet. And in all of this stuff, I won't be able to explain all of it away immediately. It'll take us a couple of examples. Okay. So some of the new terms that you're gonna run into are test statistic and p-value. All right, in proportion land, and we're back with the z's, we're gonna be making a z-score. Now, if you remember the original z-score formula, it was value minus mean over standard deviation. All right, value minus mean over standard deviation. And this kicks back to chapter seven. All right, when we're on the sampling distribution for proportions, all right, your average was the population proportion and your standard deviation was that standard error formula. So this was your sample proportion, your value, minus your mean, your population proportion, over the standard error. And if that makes sense to you, great. And if not, then crunch the formula. This is ultimately going to be a z-score. So most of the numbers that are reasonable, right, if you remember the standard normal curve, basically that z-axis goes from negative 3 to 3. So a lot of our z-scores, hopefully, well, not even hopefully, we'll see what they are. But again, keep in mind, most z-scores would be, be between negative 3 and 3. And when you get something far away from negative three or far away from three, that it actually means we're less likely to keep the null. We're probably gonna reject it. But I'll, I'll come back around to that, okay? Here's the formula. We'll just, we'll work on the mechanics initially. All right, your p-value is gonna be a probability, all right? It's gonna be the probability that if the null is true, you get sample data like you do just from chance, just because, just through random variation. And it is a probability, so this number is going to be a number between 0 and 1. And we've talked about probabilities on continuous numerical variables that go with area under a curve, right? Area under that density curve, that standard normal curve. If you've got a greater than alternate, you're going to look at the right tail of your standard normal curve. And we will find the area under that normal curve to the right of our test statistic. If you have a left-tailed test, you are going to find the area under the standard normal curve to the left of your calculated test statistic, your z-score. The fun really kicks in if you have a two-tailed test. All right, if you have a two-tailed test and your z-score is positive, 
you're going to go calculate the area to the right of that z-score and double it for symmetry. If you have a two-tailed test and your z-score is negative, you're going to find the area to the left of that z-score, that test statistic, and double it for symmetry. And I know this is really like, what on earth am I talking about? I will circle back to this, all right? We're really going to work on the mechanics initially, and then we're going to come back around to the why. So I'm going to show you the how. Like, how do I actually get all of these numbers? How do I get this test statistic? How do I get this p-value? And we will come back to the why. So I know it's all very vague right now, but welcome to hypothesis testing. It's vague initially, and then we'll stare it down. You will have to check some assumptions, but they're going to seem familiar to you, okay? So we need always our first assumption that our sample, right, our sample proportions from a random sample or a sample that represents our population, right? That was the same that we saw in confidence intervals, same as hypothesis tests, right? We need 10 successes and 10 failures in our population, right? So we're going to be checking is NP greater than or equal to 10 and is N times 1 minus P greater than or equal to 10, right? This is the deal breaker assumption. So let's make note of that deal breaker. If this assumption is not met, you can't continue the problem because without this assumption, we can't make the leap that our sampling distribution is approximately normal. All of that stuff that we talked about in chapter seven, right? If our sampling distribution isn't approximately normal, then we can't use normal CDF and we're not gonna be able to calculate the area under the curve. So this is the deal breaker. Right? And this should seem familiar also. The sample size is no more than 10% of the population size, right? And in chapter eight, we were using this acronym, sample size small relative to population. And so these assumptions are basically the same assumptions that you saw in chapter eight. The key distinction is that this doesn't say P prime anymore. This says P, all right? And we're gonna get it from our null proportion because that's the one we're assuming to be true, all right? So again, key distinction, doesn't say P prime here like it did in chapter eight, it says P. And the reason we need to make that distinction is because in hypothesis tests, which are different from confidence intervals, yes, there's a relationship, but they're gonna be different in how we run them. In hypothesis tests, you're gonna get both a sample proportion and a null proportion. So we're gonna have to distinguish which one of these is which so we can plug the right number in here. All right. Once you do all of this stuff, once you get a p-value, you, you are going to have to make a decision because ultimately you got to decide, do you want to reject the null or do you want to fail to reject the null? So we're going to talk about making our decision and this is the cutoff, all right? If your p-value, which I'm going to show you how to calculate, okay? If your p-value is less than or equal to your alpha, and we just talked about alpha, right? Our alpha level is 5% by default. Or if I give you another number, a different number, use that. But when your p-value is less than or equal to alpha, you are officially going to reject the null. If your p-value is greater than your alpha level, you're going to fail to reject the null. Now, if you reject the null, right, you're like, hey, I don't think the ho is true. I think ha is true. You're going to say you have sufficient evidence for ha. Right? We're not going to commit and say ha is actually true. Even though you think it is, we use this phrase, hey, we've got evidence for it. If you fail to reject the null, you will say you do not have sufficient evidence for the alternate, okay? Now, I know this is a lot. All right, again, you're gonna have to give me a couple of examples. Let's take a look at what 13 steps in a hypothesis test look like for you. Now, it comes to your midterm and your free response questions. Yes, you will have to do these, all right? And yes, I will need to see all 13 steps, all right? Now, the first nine are set up, okay? All right, set up. The next three, you're going to use your calculator. Well, yeah, you will. You're going to use your calculator to help you. And the last one is your conclusion. Okay, so let's go over these steps. Step one, you're going to define your parameter about which your hypotheses are to be tested. So basically, you're going to define what mu is equal to or what p is equal to. True mean of something, true proportion of something. You're going to state your null and your alternate. And we've been practicing those in this chapter. We've written a few nulls at this point, right? H sub zero, ho with a colon, ha with a colon. Right? So you're going to write those. That's steps two and three. Step four, you're going to state the alpha level. And again, the default, if I don't give you one, 
go to the industry standard of 5%. All right, the probability of making a type one error. We'll make an error, a type one error, 5% of the time. You're gonna check your assumptions. We've checked assumptions before. You had to do assumption checking in confidence interval land, right? So we've done this before. All right, we've also, back in chapter eight, we stated, well, we didn't state the distribution. I should say for step seven, we stated the name of the test. I skipped a step here. So you're gonna state the distribution to use for the test. And in this chapter only, you're either gonna be on the Z distribution, right? Which we've been calling the standard normal curve for a while. Or you're either gonna be on the T distribution. And we picked up that T distribution in chapter eight, right? When we're in mean land, but we have a small sample. So when you say, hey, state the distribution for the test, tell me Z or T, one of the two. All right, then state the name of the test. Tell me how many samples you have. Tell me what land you're in. Tell me what letter you're using, all right? Degrees of freedom, we talked about degrees of freedom in chapter eight. They have the same formula in chapter nine. Degrees of freedom, I say if applicable, because it's only applicable on the T distribution. We only apply it in mean land, all right? Z-scores, proportions, they don't have degrees of freedom. This is display the test statistic to be used without any computations at this point. So step nine is literally this formula right here. So whatever formula I give you at the top of this, right? This is quite literally step nine. You will copy this formula onto your paper for step nine. In step 10, you're gonna plug in your numbers for your particular problem. So you will tell me what your sample proportion is equal to. You will tell me what your population proportion is equal to. You will divide it by the standard error P1 minus P over your sample size. So step 10, if I head back up this way, if I scooch this up, all right, so step 10, if we look at it, is to compute the value of the test statistic showing specific numbers used, okay? Step 11 is gonna to be to calculate that, that p-value thing. And again, I'm gonna show you how to calculate it in this chapter, and we're really gonna talk about what it means towards the end of this chapter, all right? So we're gonna calculate, I'll show you the mechanics of how to do it, then I'm gonna explain what on earth it is a little bit later. I will explain a little bit of what it is because I'm gonna have you sketch a picture of a situation, right? So when you go to sketch me a picture, you have three options. If you have a less than test, you will shade some area under a curve with the left tail, okay? If you have a greater than test, a greater than alternate, you will shade the right tail. And if you have a two-sided test, you will shade both tails because the two-sided includes the left and the right tail, and I want you to just notice these, these are symmetric, right? Whatever this area under the curve is equal to, I don't know, let's say just, we'll say 5% here, this is also 5%, right? If this is 10%, this is 10%. These will always be symmetric in a two-sided test. And you'll hear me use the phrase double for symmetry, and that's what I'm talking about. Then you will finally commit. You're gonna say, hey, I reject the null, or I fail to reject the null. That's gonna be your first sentence. All right, in step 13, when you're actually drawing your conclusion, tell me officially, I reject it or I fail to reject it. And then based on whether or not you reject the null, you will tell me whether or not you have evidence for the alternate, and you will do it in context. So if you say here, I reject the null, then you will say, I have evidence for the alternate. If you fail to reject the null, you do not have evidence for the alternate. Okay, and we're gonna go through all of this. So these are your 13 steps. I know it's a lot, right? First nine are set up, all right? 10, 11, and 12, we're gonna use our calculator. It's the heart of all of these problems, right? This is where we get the work done. And then 13, we're actually gonna state our conclusion, okay? So when we get to the next page, we're gonna run our first hypothesis test. Hooray! And it'll only take us like a half hour to do. It's gonna be great. All right, I'll see you in a bit, bye. Okay, gang, let's actually go through one of these. Now, as I read this, the first thing you should try and hone in on is, am I in mean land or proportion land, right? Those are, that's always the first set of questions we wanna ask ourselves, mean land or proportion land. How many samples do I have? And admittedly, in chapter nine, it'll always be one sample, just like in chapter eight, it was always one sample. We got, what land am I in? How many samples do I have, okay? 
And then the extra component to one sample hypothesis testing is when we read this, uh, when we figure out we're in proportion land, which is not a big giveaway, we're going to be in proportion land, there's going to be two proportions given to you, and you're going to have to discern which one is the statistic and which one is the parameter. Because okay? the parameter will go into your null and alternate and show up in the beginning part of your write-up, and the statistic won't show up until, until step 10. Okay, So let's see if we can figure this out. Let's look for clues that, yeah, we are in proportion land. What clues were giving that to us? And then based on those, um, those clues, great. But then on top of that, find your two proportions and let's discern which one was the parameter, which one was the statistic, right? Which one is making a claim about everybody? Which one has to do just with our sample? All right, so the article, credit cards and college students, who pays, who benefits, described a study of credit card payment practices of college students. According to the authors of the article, the credit card industry asserts that at most 50% of students carry a balance from month to month. However, the authors of the article report that in a random sample of 310 college students, 270 carry a balance each month. Does this sample provide sufficient evidence to reject the industry claim? We will answer this question by testing, excuse me, by carrying out a hypothesis test using a 5% significance level. All right, so we've got a 5% alpha, we can see it there. Again, significance level, it's like your alpha level. That's the industry standard. All right, so let's go through this. What land were we in? Well, one of the things I noticed was this 50%. Okay, so as soon as I see a percent, I'm in proportion land. And there's actually not that many other clues in here that you're in proportion land. Nowhere in here is the word proportion. And I don't see the letter P anywhere. Uh, a different way of figuring out you were in proportion land is you could think about, well, what question did they ask, what question did the authors of this article ask each of these 310 college students? They asked them, do you carry a monthly balance on your credit card? And the answer was either yes or no. Yes, I carry a monthly credit card balance. No, I don't carry a monthly credit card balance. So at that point, you could say, well, the variable is categorical, so I know that I'm going to be in proportion land. So there's, there's not a ton of clues that you're in proportion land. Uh, I would say the percent is a great one. The other one that's a little bit more subtle is figuring out that your variable is categorical. But I'm in prop land, okay? Which means I'm gonna use a Z test statistic in the same way that we used a Z star critical value in chapter eight, you're gonna create a Z score in steps nine and 10. All right? And then you have to figure out how many samples did you take? And you only ran this survey, this experiment once, or this study, I should say. It was an observational study because you weren't imposing a treatment. Um, so you ran it once, the sample size is 310, but you only took one sample of college students. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. And then like I said, there are always two proportions hanging around. Or when we get to mean land, there's two means. You can hear one of them's 50%, and I'm not sure if you heard the other one. The success rate, again, success was carrying a credit card balance, but it was 217 out of 310. So let me go ahead and highlight that just so that we have our second proportion hanging out, all right? So we had our sample of 310 college students and 217 carried a balance. So keeping that in mind, we have to kind of pick apart, not even kind of, we have to pick apart which one was the statistic and which one is the parameter. And for me, I always feel it's easier for me to find the statistic. It comes from a sample. So you can see it right here. Here was my sample of 310. I had 217 successes, where again, we're counting successes as carrying a monthly credit card balance. So let me just crunch this number. I'll, I'll put it off to the side here. Let's see what the sample proportion is equal to. So P prime, right? So it was 217 out of 310. So if I crunch that number on my calculator, um, we've got 217 out of 310. We are looking at about 70%. Okay, that's great. I'll put that right here. All right, so we've got two proportions. This is a little hard to see. Let me erase this and make it a clearer looking 70%. All right, we've got 70% and 50%. But the thing we really wanna make sure we're clear on is this one here was the parameter. 
right? That is the claim about all students, right? So the credit card industry is saying, hey, it's at most 50%. But our sample proportion, right, our statistic is 70%. So we've got two competing claims here. All right, but with all of that, let's go through our 13 steps. And just so that we start to develop some patterns, we are not going to use this information, this 70%, until step 10. So kind of put a pin in it, we're gonna use the 50% initially. All right, so you use the parameter through all of your setup because the parameter is the one you're assuming is true. All right, so here we go. We've gotta define our parameter. That is always step one. So I'm gonna define my parameter. Because I'm in proportion land, I'm gonna define P. If I was in mean land, I'd define mu, but I'm not. So I'm gonna define P. So in this problem, I'm talking about the true proportion of some folks. So let's go ahead and start writing this. And you're gonna to wanna to write small. There's a lot of um, stuff we gotta unpack here. So P is gonna be the true proportion. All right, uh, let's think about who we are talking about. Who are we gathering information on? Well, in this case, we're gathering information on college students. And the thing that we're deeming a success for this particular problem is college students who carry a monthly credit card balance. That's what we were keeping track of. That's what these 217 students did. So this is the true proportion of college students who carry a monthly credit card balance. So there's step one. I set up what my parameter is. This is what I'm, these are the folks I'm trying to glean information on. All right, so steps two and three go together. They're your null and your alternate. So if I go back to that 13 steps, all right, so steps two and three state the null and the alternate. So that's what we've been practicing, okay? So we're gonna state our null and our alternate. And just like before, right, we've got ho and ha with colons after them. And whatever letter you defined in step one should show itself in steps two and three. So since I defined P, these should both be P's. And we know the equal sign is gonna go here and I will figure out the alternate symbol in a little bit. All right, so what is the status quo? What do I assume is true? I'm gonna assume the credit card industry is telling the truth that at most 50%. Now I'm not gonna write at most, I'm just gonna say exactly 50. Okay, so at most 50%, but I want to unpack at most 50%. So I will do that over here. We've talked about at most before, and it's been a little while since we've talked about it, but at most is like saying less than or equal to. All right, and yes, we put the equals to here, all right, instead of less than or equal to, but I want you to think about what the complement to less than or equal to is because it's gonna help us figure out what our alternate symbol should be. So if, if the credit card industry says, hey, it's at most, if this is really less than or equal to, then we're suspicious that it's greater than 50%, right? We're saying, I don't know that I believe you. I'm gonna go test if I believe you. I'm gonna go get my own sample, see what the sample proportion is, and then make my judgment based on that. And let's take a look right now, just based on your sample proportion. All right, we had 70% of our sample carrying a monthly credit card balance. Just based on that, which one do you think is true? Do you think ho or ha is true? And I would say, well, 70% looks like it's a lot larger than 50%. So I would think that the ha was true. Like, I think I'm gonna reject the null. And before we move on with this, like, let me give you some examples. Like if P prime was 90%, I would definitely think the alternate was true, right? If it was, I don't know, 75%, I would still think the alternate was true. I know that looks like a 95, but we're gonna get into a gray area. What if the sample proportion was 52%? Yeah, 52 is technically greater than 50, but is it possible that if you, if the true proportion was really 50%, is it possible my sample had 52%? Sure, that's not that big of a stretch. We saw that back when we were doing the Dixie Cups, right? We saw that um, the Dixie Cup, the, the proportion of red beads, 
I, I might have the population proportion is 17% red beads, but it was possible that somebody had a Dixie cup of 20% or 15% or 22%, right? There's sampling variability. So that's where this stats proof comes into play. What's the cutoff? All right, I, I know if you told me something like 85%, well, that's super far away from 50, but I don't know, what about 55? I'm not as sure, right? So I needed a cutoff, and that's what this hypothesis test is gonna help us with. What's that cutoff? Is it time to reject the null or fail to reject the null? Okay, so there's steps one, two, and three. All right, so step four is to state the significance level. And if I didn't give you one, default to a 5% alpha level. So let's see, did I give you a significance level? I did, I can see it right there. My alpha is 0.05. Okay, great. Now with that, we go to assumptions. All right, and our assumptions are familiar to us, right? So step five, check your assumptions. These are very similar to the assumptions that we had in chapter eight, but we're gonna run into a discrepancy here. Instead of a P prime, we're gonna use a P. Okay, so let's, let's check our assumptions. So the first assumption is, do I have a random sample? Give me a moment, let me write assumptions here. All right, did I have a random sample? Let's go through here. Yes, I didn't highlight it, but I did have a random sample. All right, so now for the normality assumption, the deal breaker one, you wanna use NP and N1 minus P. And sometimes there's confusion with students. They're like, well, how do I know? Which one do I use? Do I use 50% or 70%? Do I use P or P prime? Well, go back to what are you assuming is true? Going into any hypothesis test, do we assume the 50% is true or the 70% is true? And the answer is the 50%. You're always assuming the null is true unless you have enough data from your sample to counterbalance that or to counteract that. So we're always assuming the null is true. So use your null proportion. Or another way of saying that is, you're not gonna use this number until step 10. So put a pin in it and save it for later. So let's see, our N in this case was 310. Our null proportion was 50%. I'll, cut, I'll crunch that in a bit. This is 310 times one minus 50%. So let me crunch these. So we've got here 310 times 0.5. We're looking at about 155. All right, and then we'll do 310 times its complement, which also happens to be 50% because the complement to 50% is 50%, so we're getting the same number, 155 again. All right, and these are both greater than or equal to 10, so the central limit theorem is kicked in, and I think I'm going off of a sampling distribution that's approximately normal. Now. What are these numbers trying to tell us? First off, 155 plus 155, if I added these two numbers together, and I know they happen to be the same, but they should always add up to your sample size. This means, theoretically, if, if the null is true, I should have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures in my sample, meaning if the null was true and I surveyed 310 college students, I expected to see 155 of them carrying a credit card balance and 155 of them not carrying a credit card balance. And you can start to see the discrepancy, right? We thought 155, what did we actually see? 217, that's a huge increase, especially proportionally speaking, right? That's almost like 50% over what I thought it was gonna be. That's, that's a lot. All right, so right out the gate, right? I'm also, I'm already thinking like, man, I, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna reject the null. So let's, let's continue to go forward with this. Your third assumption is that your sample size is small relative to your population. And if you remember last time, I'll, I'll put that, gosh, I'm gonna run out of room. Let me, let me scooch that in right here. What you do is you take your sample size, so I'll take, oops, I don't have 155. I have 310 of them. So I will take my sample size of 310 I will multiply that by 10 and get 3,100 students. All right, 
Do I think there are more than 3,100 students out there carrying a credit card balance uh, or even just having a credit card? I absolutely do. So I would say my sample size is small relative to my population, meaning I can sample without replacement. I'm not violating into any independence laws. So this is great. We're through our assumptions. All right, fantastic. So moving on from there, if we go to step number six, all right, this is gonna say state the distribution that we're gonna use. And again, your two options are your Z distribution or your T distribution. When you're in proportion land, you're using the standard normal, the Z. When you're in mean land, you're using the T. So I'm just gonna write Z distribution. You can either write Z distribution or standard normal distribution. It, it doesn't matter. Actually, for this first example, I'll write both just so you can see the options. All right, so in step six, I can write the Z distribution. That's a completely acceptable answer. Or you could have written standard normal distribution, the one that we picked up in chapter six. Okay. All right, so step seven. Step seven is to actually state the name of the test. All right, so when we're talking about the name, tell me what land you're in. Well, let's do with how many samples you have, what land you're in, what letter you're using. All right, so we've got samples, letter. No, it doesn't matter what order you go in, but I'm gonna go samples, land, letter. All right, so here we go. And actually, since it's gonna be a longer um, set of words, I'm gonna move it to this next line down here. Let me scoot all of this up. So as we do this, I think that's looking good enough. So here we go, step seven. I have one sample. I am in proportion land. And I am running a Z hypothesis test. So one sample proportion Z hypothesis test or one sample prop Z test. Okay, that's great. Step eight, again, this is all just the setup. Step eight is to state the degrees of freedom. And similarly uh, to chapter eight, there are no degrees of freedom when you're in proportion land. Right? If you're on the standard normal curve, there are no degrees of freedom. That's why I put here state degrees of freedom if applicable. And in prop land, one sample prop land, no degrees of freedom. So in a moment, I'm going to write degrees of freedom not applicable. Actually, let me just do that now. And then we're going to come back and do step nine. All right, so step eight, degrees of freedom is not applicable. All right. Now step nine is going to be to compute our test statistic. So display the test statistic to be used without any computation at this point. So when I ask you to do that, I quite literally want you to write this formula on step nine. This is step nine, all right? And so that I'm not flipping back and forth between the pages all that much more often, um, I just wanna say that step 10, we're gonna take our formula in step nine and plug our numbers from our particular problem into it, and I'm gonna compute the value of this test statistic. All right, so let's write down the formula of that test statistic. I'm gonna actually move the page up further because I, I need some room to do all of this. Okay, so step nine, our test statistic is always a value minus, oops, that is P prime, a value minus a mean over a standard error. So value minus our proportion mean over our standard error. And if you wonder why I'm saying mean, I'm just gonna kick you back to chapter seven for a moment. We used to say that sampling proportions were distributed normally. This was the center and the standard deviation. So sometimes we refer to that as the mean. And I know that can be confusing because you're talking about the average of a proportion. You're like, what? But it's the center of your sampling distribution. So. When I say value minus mean over standard error, that's what I'm referring to. All 
Okay, so moving along from there, step 10 is gonna be us putting in our particular numbers. All right, what was my sample proportion? 70%. What was my null proportion? 50%. So I'm gonna put 50% here, here, and here. And what was my sample size? 310. So here we go. We would have 70 minus 50 in ratio to the square root of 50, one minus 50, and our sample size here was 310. Okay. Now for the sake of this first problem, I want you to just trust me on this next bit. Okay, I'm gonna actually tell you what the number is. I'm gonna tell you this was 7.04, and I don't usually lie to people. I don't wanna say I never lie, because I feel like that is inherently or paradoxically a lie. But just trust me, this would be 7.04. And you can crunch it on your calculator if you want to try and enter this, this into your calculator, that's fine. But for right now, oops, I moved the paper. Just trust me, because I'll, I'll, when I get to how we can do all of this on our calculator, I'll show you a nicer way of getting that number where you don't have to enter this whole string in on your calculator, okay? And I want to focus right now on p-value. So p-value is that new term that we were talking about that it's, it's the least familiar thing we've got. So step 11 is to always calculate the p-value. And step 12 is gonna to be to draw a picture. I'm gonna do these in tandem because they go together, okay? All right, so p-value. You're gonna hear me talk about the p-value. It is a probability, and I'll just say now, it's the probability that if the null is true, you will get a test statistic, the 7.04 number, What's the likelihood, what's the probability that if the null were true, you get a test statistic like you did, or potentially even more extreme, just through chance, just through random variation. All right, so we're gonna calculate the area under that Z curve. And if we, let's see what our alternate was. Um, our alternate was a greater than. So I'm gonna calculate the area under the Z curve to the right of the calculated Z. All right, so I'm gonna be on this top line here. When I calculate a p-value, when we do step 11, keep in mind it is a probability. Every probability, every proportion, percentage, um, probability, now p-value, all of those p-words, they're always numbers between 0 and 1. Okay? All right. So like I said, I'm going to do steps 11 and 12 in tandem because they, they go together. One's the number side of things, one's the graph side of things. All right, so let me over here do step 12 first. I want you to think about Z being 7.04. So go back to your chapter six days and think about drawing a graph for me, okay? And when I say graph, we wanna draw the standard normal distribution because that is the graph, that is the PDF, that is the distribution that we are on, okay? So let me draw this standard normal curve. Something like that. Again, not my best Z curve, not my worst. All right, if I was gonna label this axis, this would be the Z axis, okay? And then what's the number that's under the peak? Well, we know the Z's got a, a center of zero and a standard deviation of one, right? And we said most Z scores are between three deviations above and below the mean. If you remember from chapter um, six, right? We know 99.7% of deviations are between three and negative three. I don't have to write these numbers in here, but I just want to remind you about the standard normal curve. And then I want you to think where on the Z axis is the number 7.04, right? So if I went one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm almost off the curve. I don't even know if my pencil is in view here, but how about just for, for graph sake, we say that's 7.04. That is running right up along the Z letter. Let me, let me space this out a bit better just so we can see all of this, okay? So let's pretend here is 7.04, right? And then I, I was coming here with the Z. All right, but I think you'll give me the Z. It, it's to the right, right? We're very much to the right of that Z axis. Okay, so what I want to do, because I have a right tail test, because I have a greater than alternate, I wanna shade the area under the curve to the right of the calculated Z-score. Right, and I want you to imagine how much area 
I mean, I get that this extends forever, but how much area is underneath that curve from 7.04 to the right? I mean, you can see how much area under that curve did I shade? I hope you're saying in your head that looks like zero, right? I didn't shade 90% of my curve, 10% of my curve. I shaded practically zero. And that means that the number that I get in step 11 should be very close to zero. So this is step 12. This is the graphic version of what's happening. But now let's go calculate the area under that curve. And we have done area under a curve for a while. All right, we call that, or we use normal CDF to do that. So for step 11, my p-value, all right, it's gonna be a probability. So you owe me p with some stuff in parentheses. Same thing we did in chapter three as now. All right, so here's how this works. You owe me a letter, a symbol, and a number, okay? The letter you use will be the letter you defined in step six and step nine. So I'm gonna have a Z, okay? The symbol you use, you have two options. You will either have a greater than or a less than. In this case, because we have a greater than alternate, we have a greater than symbol here, okay? So let me just write, you owe me a letter, then you owe me a symbol, and then you owe me a number. Okay, so we've done the letter, it was Z. We've done the symbol, it was greater than. All right, now let's do the number. The number is whatever you got in step 10. All right, that's why step 10 comes before step 11, because you use it. All right, so you owe me a letter, a symbol, and a number. All right, let me erase this. Letter, symbol, and number. All right. Now, how do we calculate these probabilities? Well, we've been doing it for a while, but it, it's been a couple of chapters. I think we haven't done this since chapter seven. So we're gonna go normal CDF. We're gonna go low, high, mean, standard deviation. So my low on the x-axis, or excuse me, the z-axis is 7.04. My high is infinity, because I'm going all the way to the right, and we type that in as 1E99. My mean, well, on the standard normal curve, zero is always under the peak, and one is always the standard deviation. So let's crunch that number, see what we're getting here. All right, low, high, mean standard deviation. And I'm telling you, it should be close to zero because that was what our graph was showing us. Right? We always have that these numbers should match our graph. True in chapter six, true now. So let's go into normal CDF. We're gonna go low, high, mean, standard deviation, and we're looking at 9.67, and I get this every year, where students will tell me, hey, Miss A, it's 9.67, okay? The p-value is a probability. Again, it's the probability that if the data, if the null was true, that we would have seen 70% just by chance. If the, if the true average, or if the true proportion was really 50%, what's the likelihood we'd get sample data showing 70% just through chance? just through or random uh, chance sampling variation, uh, it, it, it can't be 9.67 because the p-value is a probability. It's gotta be a number between zero and one. And please don't ignore the e to the negative 13 here. This thing is straight up zero. We're seeing if the null was true, all right, if the industry, if the credit card industry's claim that at most 50% of college students carry a credit card balance was true, if the true proportion was really 50%, What's this chance that your sample data would pop back out 70%, this large of a discrepancy? It would never happen, all right? This is our, our probability, right? Our p-value is telling us, dude, the likelihood that you would get test data like this just through random variation would never happen if the null were true, and that was our initial assumption, which means it's time to reject the null. And here's the cutoff, okay? So how do you know if you officially reject the null or fail to reject the null. Compare the p-value to the alpha level. So the p-value is always step 11. The alpha level is always step four. So you've got to decide, is step 11 less than or equal to step four? Or is step 11 greater than step four? Well, right now, our, our step 11 was zero. And that is less than or equal to our alpha level of 5%. So because our p-value was less than alpha, we're gonna reject H-naught. 
And I say that because that is the first sentence that you owe me for step 13. You gotta tell me what you're gonna do to the null. Are you gonna reject it? Or are you gonna fail to reject it? So here is what your first sentence of your conclusion should look like. So I'm gonna scoot this up some more. All right, so we should say, because our p-value is less than alpha, we reject h naught. Okay. So commit one way or the other. You're either gonna tell me you reject the null or you fail to reject the null. All right, but here we go. Our p-value was less than alpha, so it's time to reject h naught. Now, if you reject h naught, that means you believe the alternate is true. And we're gonna use the phrase, we have sufficient evidence. So we're very non-committal. We're not like, yes, it's true, no, it's not true. Even though that's how, what you might think, we're gonna either say we have evidence or we do not have evidence. But when you reject h naught, you have sufficient evidence for the alternate, all right? And that's the second sentence you owe me. You have to tell me what you're doing with the alternate. So I would say we have sufficient evidence or there is sufficient evidence and I'm going to write the incorrect version here and then fix it. So you could say there is sufficient evidence for HA, all right? But I don't want you to use the symbol HA. I want you to tell me what on earth the alternate is saying. So let's go back to the alternate and try and decipher it and then we'll write it up. So if we look at our alternate, it says P is greater than 50%. So I have evidence that this is true. Well, what does P represent? I have evidence that the true proportion of college students who carry a monthly credit card balance is greater than 50%. That's what I have evidence for, and that's what I'm going to say. So let me move this all the way back up. I'm gonna erase the word for HA or the words for HA, I'm gonna say we have, or there is sufficient evidence that the true proportion of college students who carry a monthly credit card balance sorry, um, is between, oops, it's not is between. I'm having a good time, sorry, here we go. Is greater than 50%. All right, I was saying is between because I was flashing back to doing a confidence interval, but that's not what we have. The alternate says, we have sufficient evidence that the true proportion of college students who carry a monthly credit card balance is greater than 50%. Okay, great. That's it. Or we could say this sample provides sufficient evidence to reject the industry claim. And where I'm getting that phrasing was my original wording here, right? So does the sample provide sufficient evidence to reject the industry claim? Yes, it does. When you see the word evidence, especially with sufficient evidence, that's code for run a hypothesis test. So let me scoot this back up in case you didn't get all of it. I wanna make sure we have a chance to write it all down. But when you hear evidence, Right, if you're questioned about evidence, run a hypothesis test. That's what they're asking you to do, okay? It's synonymous with, uh, and I'll put that this was basic, we started these in chapter nine, but if you ever hear estimate, right, that was what we were asking, or when we were asking you to create a confidence interval. And that was a chapter eight problem, okay? But evidence is definitely synonymous with hypothesis test. Yes, we have evidence. No, we don't have evidence, okay? All right, so with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hop over to my calculator and I want you to take a look in terms of how did my calculator help me get step 10, step 11, and step 12. So this 10, 11, and 12 shenanigans you can get off of your calculator. I mentioned it here. 
right? That if you have steps 10, or when you're doing steps 10, 11, and 12, your calculator will help you with that. So I'm gonna flip over to the calculator, and then we're gonna run this problem on our calculator, call it a day on example seven, and then we're gonna try a whole new one in example eight. I'll see you in a bit, bye. Hey, Math 43, I want us to take a look at how we're going to run our hypothesis tests on our calculator. And for me personally, when I'm going through my 13 step write up, I actually start with the technology first. I'll, I'll go do all my technology, get the output from there and use that output to help me write up my um, 13 steps. Uh, specifically, your calculator can help you with steps 10, 11 and 12. But I usually like to cut to the chase, right? I just I plug it all into my calculator, see what it says. And then I I call it reverse engineering. Then I'll have my um, output help me inform my 13 step write up. So when we were going through this in the other video, or at least at the beginning of this video, when we got to step 10, I kind of said, hey, just trust me, the z-score, the test statistic is 7.04. Um, and I wasn't lying to you, but I, I want you to see where that comes from now. So let's, let's figure out how do we get step 10 on our calculator. So let's hit stat. We're going to go over to tests. And we've been here before. If I scroll down, we were here in chapter eight. I got to scroll down a bunch. And sometimes there's a little bit of lag time on this one. All right, if you remember, you see all the word int here and interval, those were all of our confidence intervals. And if you remember from chapter eight, anytime you saw the word prop, that meant you were in proportion land. And by default, if you didn't see prop, it actually implied that it was in mean land. So seven, eight, nine, and zero are in mean land, A and B are in proportion land. And in proportion land, they actually specify one sample proportion Z interval, two sample proportion Z intervals. We haven't gotten to the two sample version that's coming in chapter 10. And I wish they were more specific in mean land, but they're, they're not. So how this works is if you don't see the ones, excuse me, if you don't see the number two, it's implied that it's a one. So this is one sample mean Z, one sample mean T, two sample mean Z, two sample mean T. And in chapter eight, we were basically using option eight or option A, depending on if we were a mean or proportion land. Okay, so let me scroll back up to the top of this, and then I want you to take a look at what our options are now. I'm gonna keep going, there we go. We have basically the same six options, but now they have the word test next to them. So this is where you're gonna start your basic hypothesis tests. So again, if you see the word prop, right, you're in proportion land. Proportion lands always deal with disease. If you don't see the word prop, like options one through four, it's implied you're in mean land. Mean land, you can use the Z's or the T's, but we're going to use the T's in here, just like we did in chapter eight. So basically in chapter nine, you'll either use option two or you'll use option five. So just depending on if we're in mean land or proportion land. And for this problem, we're in proportion land. So in a moment, I'm going to hit five. But I also just want to kind of give you a preview of what's to come. So if I scroll down for a little while, let me go past the intervals, and I want us to take a look what's down here. So what's coming as we start to progress through these chapters is in chapter 11, we'll pick up the chi-squared test and the chi-squared Goff test. And if you're not sure what I'm saying when I say chi, that's this letter here. It kind of looks like an X, but it's the Greek letter chi. So we've got the chi-squared test and then something called the chi-squared goodness of fit test. And if you have a TI-83, you're not going to see this test, all right, which is a bummer. I'll show you the workaround. It's a little bit more annoying, but I will show it to you. Um, we're not going to do the two-sample F test in here. Um, we've taken a look at linear regression t-test. We did it a long time ago. In Chapter 12, we used linear regression t-test to find that S, the average residual length, so we could determine if there are outliers present in our data. Um, if we were going to take a look back at um, linear regression again, we could run hypothesis tests off of the slope or the y-intercept, and that's what um, options F and G are for. One's the test, one's the interval. Um, in chapter 13, we're going to do ANOVA, so we are going to circle back um, to mean land in chapter 13, and we will pick up something called ANOVA. And I, I put all of that in here just to explain which ones we're using, right, and what chapters they're covered in. So if you look at the um, lecture key, 
all of that's covered, the ones that we're going to use and the ones that we're not going to use. So with that, let's get to the one that we are going to use. We're going to use option five. So I want to go into the one sample proportion Z test. And let me get my page back to our problem. Okay. So when you see the P sub zero here, that's talking about what was the null proportion. And the credit card industry was claiming that the true proportion of college students who carried monthly credit card balances was about 50%. The next two lines have to be whole numbers. Right? It has to be your number of successes and then your sample size. So here we were calling success a student who carried a monthly credit card balance. So that was a, I believe, oops, that is the wrong. Let me do this, let me clear this out. All right, so let me go into this line. This is the one, 217, right, enter, 310, Oops, did not hit my enter. There we go, enter. And my sample size was 310, okay? And then here, you need to choose what your alternate is. This is for when you have a two-sided test, a not equals to alternate. This is when you have a left-tailed or one-sided test, the less than test. This is when you have the greater than, the right side, or excuse me, the right-tailed or different one-sided test. And let's see, what did we have? We had the greater than alternate. So I'm gonna go over, highlight this, hit enter to make it live. And you see you have two options. You have calculate and you have draw. And we will use both of them. But for step 10, this z-score test statistic, we're gonna calculate. So let's calculate a few things. Let me scroll down. You see calculate flashing, let me hit enter. And then a whole bunch of stuff pops up, right? So there's my z-score, there's step 10. So that second line, on that calculator output screen, that is step 10. That's where I was getting my 7.04, all right? The third line is step 11. This is your p-value. You see p, right? That's standing for p-value. Please don't tell me the p-value is 9.48. It's definitely not 9.48. We can't ignore the e to the negative 13. So that p-value is zero. And if you remember from um, our work, that was our p-value. You can see it right here over at zero. All right, and here when I did it by hand, well not by hand, but when I use normal CDF, I got 9.67 times e to the negative 13 for my p-value, which is still zero. There's a slight round off error because I, I rounded my z-score to 7.04, not 7.04, and so on. This right here, you can see this is your sample proportion and this is your sample size. So from that calculator screen, again, here's step 10, here's step 11. So I, I can get those directly. I don't even actually need to use normal CDF to get my p-value. Great. Let's go back into this. So we'll hit stat, go over to tests, option five. It's saving the things that we just did. That's fine. But now I want us to go draw. Let's see what the draw option looks like. So when I hit enter, ooh, it looks like I still have something that I was graphing. All right, so my, my graph's got, it looks like I've got a scatter plot on. Let's see what's on. Um, it does look like I have a scatter plot. I guess I was making a normal probability plot last time we were here. Let me turn that off. All right. And now let me rerun this again. So I'm going to go stat, tests, five. Let's go draw this. And then I'll have that, that z-score, or that standard normal curve without the normal probability plot on. So there you go, you see your z-score here is 7.04, right? You've got your standard normal distribution. Because the p-value was zero, I'm not shading any area under that curve, right? If this p-value had been 20%, you would have seen about 20% of the area under the curve shaded. And this is only our first example. So we will look at examples where there's some shading in, um, but we just don't, we don't have it in this case. Because again, standard normal curve, right? You know, zero is under the peak. This is one, two, three, right? Negative one, negative two, negative three. And you see your test statistic is 7.04. 7.04 is like somewhere over here on the z-axis. And there's no area to the right of that curve, which is why your p-value is zero, okay? So that's how you can use your calculator to get you steps 10 and 11, right? If you do the stat test and then you go with the calculate option. If you do the stat test and you go with the draw option, it'll give you step 12. So like I said, I personally, when I'm running a hypothesis test, I'll use technology first, and then I'll use all of that output to help me write up my 13-step proof, all right? 
Okay, gang, that's our first look at a hypothesis test together, and I will catch you over in Meanland. Bye.